Hey guys, today I'm going to be doing a book review on Straight On Till Morning by Liz Braswell and Evil Thing by Serena Valentino. Straight On Till Morning is book eight in the Twisted Tales series by Liz Braswell. 16-year-old Wendy Darling dreams of adventure and excitement, but her parents see her as unruly and plan on sending her to Ireland as a governess. Four years ago, Wendy nearly met Peter Pan, the hero from her tales of adventure in a place called Neverland. She still holds on to hope that she may one day travel there with him. An unlikely opportunity occurs when Wendy has the chance to travel to Neverland with Captain Hook, the nefarious pirate enemy of Peter Pan. As she travels with Hook, Wendy discovers his plans to destroy Neverland permanently, and she is determined to find Peter Pan with the help of Tinkerbell and the Lost Boys before Neverland is gone forever. Once again, this was another fun, exciting entry into the Twisted Tales series put out by, I guess, Disney Press. <laughs> I wouldn't say this is one of my favorites in the series. Um, it would definitely kind of be a little bit lower on my list, but this was still fun in its own way and I still appreciated it. And I have read so many different Peter Pan retellings over the years. I've seen so many adaptations. Uh, the story of Peter Pan has almost kind of reached a point that's a little boring to me, um, but this particular um, adaptation, if you will, since this is part of the Twisted Tales series, there are definitely some really interesting change-ups and twists and turns that I really appreciated that made this particular retelling a whole lot more uh, refreshing and interesting. And for starters, uh, the main character, Peter Pan, he's practically non-existent in this novel, which was kind of crazy but really interesting and really well done in some ways. I kind of liked it, to be quite honest. Um, Peter Pan is, he really only pops up near the end of this particular novel. Um, the sole focus is on Wendy Darling. So, as all Twisted Tales books do, they ask a what-if scenario. What is the big thing being changed up and twisted uh, that, that really shifts the narrative that you know? So, for this particular uh, installment, it's asking what if Wendy first traveled to Neverland with Captain Hook? Because we all know the traditional telling of Peter Pan. Wendy goes to Neverland with Peter Pan, um, and she's with her brothers and whatnot. But the big catch of this is that four years prior, she did meet Peter Pan, but things didn't go the way as planned. Something kind of happened. And Wendy ended up not going to Neverland with Peter Pan. So the novel, that's where we start in this novel. We, we are four years from that event, and Wendy is now a 16-year-old woman who is facing 16-year-old issues and problems. And I absolutely love the characterization of Wendy in this book. I love that she was aged up. <laughs> um, she She's a very independent, strong-minded young woman. Um, she dreams of adventure and fun and uh, her life in London is just so boring and so mundane and her life has already been mapped out. It's been charted out for her by, by what her parents say and what society says a young woman should be going towards next. So her parents and society see her as really unruly. They see her strange and awkward. And what is Neverland? Because she is constantly talking about Neverland and she's always writing stories of adventure that take place in Neverland and Peter Pan is the hero of these stories and she's part of the stories as well. So her parents see this as very strange and odd and there's like something mentally wrong and disturbed with her, you know? So their plan is, hey, um, we're going to send you to Ireland to become a governess because we're embarrassed and we're hoping this is going to fix you. <laughs> And Wendy is having none of this. She's like, oh, hell no. I need to get out of here. So th through a chance opportunity, um, Captain Hook, of all people, comes to her rescue. <laughs> and she travels to Neverland for the first time with Captain Hook. And 
Uh, I was a tad bit disappointed that Wendy didn't spend more time with Captain Hook because I thought that would have been really, really fascinating. Um, she really only spends a small section of this book with Captain Hook, but it's just enough time to build up Captain Hook, especially as the villain of this story, and it's just enough time for Wendy to gather the idea of, oh, hey, he's thinking of destroying Neverland permanently, but how? I need to figure out how he plans on destroying it. And, uh-oh, he has Peter Pan's shadow, because four years prior, Peter Pan's shadow um, got disconnected. It stayed in London, and now Wendy has the shadow, and she's, you know, she has the shadow in her possession. She wants to bring it back to Peter Pan, but now Captain Hook has the shadow. So, it's a whole big fiasco you guys. And a lot of the plot revolves around Peter Pan's shadow that Captain Hook is planning on using the shadow for some nefarious sinister purpose <laughs> that I never quite understood. <laughs> but we just roll with it. You just got to roll with it with this novel because some some of his plans, it's like, what, what was his purpose exactly? <laughs> but either way, Wendy as the character, I loved her as our primary protagonist and her, her independence, her strong-mindedness, and f she's a fairly modern woman to some extent. Not too modern, because uh, I was a little worried. I was like, okay, she's coming across as a little too modern for the time period, but I think she was m kind of just enough modern, because um, it's this is still a time period where women are like, hey, I want my voice to be heard. I, I want to be able to vote. I want to be able to do the same things I men do, you know? So it's kind of this changing point in history where Wendy is at, that her her modernness is kind of just enough, you know, that she's starting to kind of become a modern woman and whatnot. Um, but I, did, I loved her as, as a character, and even though this book is all about Wendy, Another big pleasant surprise with this novel is how much Tinkerbell was in it. Because if you've seen the cartoon, and then I believe it's even the case in, in the book as well by J.M. Barry, um, Tinkerbell and Wendy do not have the best relationship. They are rivals. There is a jealousy for the affections of Peter Pan. So what Liz Braswell does so wonderfully and brilliantly with this novel is for Wendy and Tinkerbell to put aside their differences and really talk with one another uh, and communicate um, because their common goal is to save Peter Pan and to save Neverland from being destroyed by Captain Hook. So they have these shared goals with one another and over the course of this novel they, they hash out their jealousy and issues with one another and they start to see each other in a different way and really appreciate each other and really rely on each other. Um, and, and yeah, I, I think if anything, that, that bond and friendship that develops between Wendy and Tinkerbell is really the core reason you need to pick up this book. Because this is not a book about the relationship between Wendy and Peter Pan like, mo like most adaptations are. Um, so yeah, that was the most refreshing aspect of this book. So heading into some of my little minor nitpicks that I had with this novel. Um, this is a fairly lengthy novel, especially for a novel that's aimed more at like kind of a middle grade slash young adult audience. Um, it's kind of a lengthy novel. And I, I do think the pace is a tad bit slow in places. It's, it's very much a, a quest if you will. The nature of this book runs like a quest and it's it's Wendy and Tinkerbell going from one obstacle to the next and things constantly hindering their progress. So sometimes the pace did suffer a bit from kind of just the constant movement from quest to quest to quest, obstacle to obstacle to obstacle and whatnot. So it did read a little bit slow in places but I don't think to the extent that it was dry or boring because I certainly never felt bored. It just kind of felt a little slow because sometimes it felt like not much was happening and then all of a sudden a lot would happen. Next up, some of the world building. In general, I loved Liz Braswell's descriptions of Neverland. She really brings a life and vibrancy to Neverland and kind of what it looks like and the inhabitants and you know, just some of the landscaping and whatnot. I think she does a really good job of, of helping you to visualize Neverland. But 
my issue does have a lot to do with the world building and just, I, I guess, the, the existence of Neverland, if that makes sense. I'm, I'm not quite sure how to describe it. Um, I didn't understand the existence of Neverland because in most adaptations and retellings, you kind of get the idea that Neverland is like this secret mystery island that's just out in the middle of nowhere and only children can go there, you know? But in this, how Liz Braswell kind of does it, it's like Neverland is a product of the imagination of just all children, that all children have the capability of creating Neverland and, and adding their own little influences and their own identity within the nature of, of Neverland. Like some of the creatures and some of the beings that, that Wendy meets over the course of the novel, they're products of other children, you know? Um, that's kind of how I was trying to understand it. I'm not sure if I'm making sense. It's really hard to describe what my issue is, because uh, the best way I can think of it is that I was having trouble comprehending just the existence of Neverland, because Liz Braswell, the way she kind of does it, it's, it's done in a much different way than how I was just thinking about it. Because, yeah, Wendy, even though she has never been to Neverland, it's like she knows about it. She knows the people that are on there. She knows who Peter Pan is. She knows the Lost Boys. She knows Captain Hook. It's like she knows all these people. And, yeah, she she writes the stories. It's like she writes about it and she creates things that are going on within it. And, like, that's the that's how Neverland exists. It's through the storytelling and imagination of children. I guess, does that make sense? I really don't know, but it was really kind of confusing to me and I didn't quite grasp it that well. And then my other complaint with this novel, I really would have appreciated Tiger Lily in this book. I don't know if putting Tiger Lily in this book would have just been too much. Um, as we know, the cartoon and, and even the book is highly, uh, highly insensitive and racist when it comes to the native inhabit inhabitants of Neverland. We all know that. Um, Liz Braswell, it, it just seems so glaringly obvious that she just kind of purposely took them out of the narrative. And I don't, I, it, it, like I said, it's just, it just very obvious. And I kept waiting for like Tiger Lily to pop up and she never does. Um, and it's never explained, you know, it's never explained like that whole group of people is just gone. They're completely omitted and it did feel a little bizarre. And I would have really appreciated Tiger Lily being in this novel as well because, as I said, Tinkerbell and Wendy have a rivalry and also Tiger Lily and Wendy have a rivalry. So that would have been a great way to have all three of these young girls really connect and bond you know, and kind of mend that relationship that's often very, very fraught in most retellings and adaptations. So it was, it was a very strange omission that Tiger Lily was just absolutely cut from this. And once again, I just don't know if it had to do with, there's already a lot going on in this book, you know, if it had to do with that or if Liz Braswell just maybe felt uncomfortable, which is a, which is a possibility she just felt uncomfortable kind of bringing in those that group of characters you know because it's maybe not her place to tell that story you know it's hard to tell but i, I really would have liked tiger lily to make an appearance i think that would have been kind of cool so overall another really great installment to the twisted tales series uh what if wendy traveled to neverland with captain hook that whole premise really worked for me i liked it i liked seeing Wendy aged up a little bit, made her more interesting, I think, and more relatable. Um, yeah, overall, I like the story. The twists and turns worked for me. I love that relationship with Wendy and Tinkerbell. It's definitely just the kind of, really, the big sole reason you should pick up this book to begin with. Um, so yeah, if, if you like the Twisted Tale series and you have yet to pick this one up, I think you might pleasantly like it. So yeah, we're going to be moving on to the next Disney-themed book. Evil Thing is book seven in the Disney Villains series by Serena Valentino and is an origin story for Cruella de Vil from 101 Dalmatians. Oh my god, I actually liked a book in the Villains series? 
say what? <laughs> um, if you happen to have been watching these videos or if you've read my reviews, I have not been enjoying the Villains series by Serena Valentino. I have found them to be absolute trash, absolute garbage. I know that may sound terribly cruel and mean, but that's how I have been feeling. Um, because the only other book that I liked was the very, very first book in the series, which was uh, Fairest of All, which focused on the Evil Queen from Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. I absolutely love that book. And then ever since, the series has been just absolute trash, and I've hated them. But Evil Thing, oh wow, I loved this book. And why I loved it ha had a lot to do with the fact that it, it's a standalone, and it is solely focused on Cruella, and the Odd Sisters are not in it. The Odd Sisters are a trio of characters that have been in every other damn book in this series, and they have absolutely ruined it for me. I don't get it. So yeah, this book, focusing on Cruella, I really absolutely loved it. <laughs> so kind of breaking down the things that I did like about this book, um, starting with the fact that it is a standalone. What? The unfortunate thing with the other books in the villain series is that they're not standalones, which is absolutely frustrating. You have to read the books in order, in order to understand what the hell is even going on. Fortunately, with this Cruella book, you can read, if it's your first book within the Disney Villains series, you're good to go. You can pick this book up, and it has nothing to do with anything that has gone on in the prior books. And yeah, the Odd Sisters are nowhere in this book, which I loved, because I hate the Odd Sisters, you guys, with a passion, a fiery passion, a fiery hatred. Um, now, there are some Easter eggs. If you have read the other books in the villain series, there are some Easter eggs that some, some of the characters from the other books are mentioned, um, but that's just, just it. They're just Easter eggs, and they're part of a fairy tale set of books that Cruella and Anita loved as children and whatnot. So that's the only spot where they make an appearance, you know, characters from the other books. It's just through a set of fairy tales that the two of them like. Um, so that was fine. The other thing that I loved about this book is the fact that Cruella is the star of this book. Because my main huge issue with the other books in the villain series, other than Fairest of All, because I, like I said, I love that one, the other, the other books, they're supposed to be origin stories for your favorite Disney villains, but they hardly appear in their own damn book, which is so frustrating. Because for some reason, Serena Valentino was obsessed with her original characters that she created, and the stories became all about them, rather than about the Disney villains, which was just so disappointing and so frustrating. So the great thing about this book, it's narrated entirely in first person with Cruella de Vil, and I love that. We get to see Cruella as a little girl, her, her life in London, uh, her relationship with her parents, um, her desire to, to make something of herself, to prove her worth, to really gain her mother's love. Um, because Cruella has a very interesting relationship with her mother over the course of this book. She doesn't realize kind of the cruel nature of her mother, that her mother is just so self-absorbed self and she just cares about wealth and money and buying things. And Cruella thinks her mother's love is when her mother buys her things. That's not love, you know? Her mother will buy her a fancy new fur fur jacket or something, buy her something f fancy and expensive, and Cruella thinks that's love, but it's not. Um, so I love that relationship. I also love the relationship that Cruella has with Anita. We see that they go to school together. We see that in, that Cruella really st sticks up sticks up for Anita when people are being mean and cruel to Anita because Anita uh, is not kind of part of that social class in some ways. Um, she's considered an orphan and she's not considered 
rich like everybody else that goes to this school, but Cruella loves Anita, you know, and really sticks up for her. So there's a lot of great things being explored over the course of this novel that, yeah, if you've seen the Disney cartoon 101 Dalmatians, you'll see all these influences and see how Cruella becomes just the truly psychopathic villain that she becomes. What gets her to that point that she would want to sit and brutally, cruelly murder Dalmatian puppies? And I tell you what, you guys, this this book, if you in particular really like something like Downton Abbey, there are so many elements of this book that I was just getting all sorts of like Downton Abbey vibes. It made me want to watch Downton Abbey quite badly because there's a lot of stuff like, you know, uh, Cruella who, who lives upstairs, obviously, and she has a nice life of privilege and she can be a bit of a snob, but then there's also like this downstairs element and her relationship with the downstairs servants, you know, the maids, the cook, uh, you know, the household help, if you will. Um, there's a very Downton Abbey-esque kind of vibe that you get with this novel, which I really quite loved. And once again, since this novel is so heavily focused on Cruella, um, it really, surprisingly enough, deals a lot with Cruella's mental health. Um, like I said, I already mentioned a lot with her mother and what Cruella thinks is love, you know? Um, it, poor Cruella, there's a lot of mental health issues that she, she goes through over the course of this novel, which is very, very fascinating. And Serena Valentino, she... She doesn't particularly, because Cruella is still a villain, you know, she's still kind of a bad person. Serena Valentino, she, she doesn't totally want you to sympathize with Cruella, but more than anything, she wants you to understand Cruella and where she's coming from and how she gets to the place that she does. Um, and that's what I really appreciate, because Cruella, she is, she's kind of suffering from depression in her own ways and, and grief. And there's, there's, weirdly enough, for a little book like this, there's a lot to kind of analyze with her as a character, uh, just her psychology, you know, her, her nature and how she becomes the lady that she becomes in 101 Dalmatians, you know, and, okay, how does she get from this point to this point that she's going to murder a bunch of puppies, you know, because that's just one of the most horrible things of 101 Dalmatians, you know, that you as the viewer are like, oh my god, look at all these cute puppies. How could someone just be so evil that they would want to skin these puppies for a fur coat of all things, you know? So I love how all of that is explored and a lot of it is just ex explored through her mental health and just this this really complex backstory that you get with her that's so really fascinating. Yeah, this is a book for like a middle grade teenage audience, but it, it's still really well done, I think, and really explores some interesting topics and issues. So you guys, that is it for my thoughts and my feelings on these two Disney themed books. Both books I highly enjoyed. Uh, I can't wait to move on to the next books in both of these series. Um, so yeah, you guys, in the comments below, have you guys read either of these books? Do you plan on reading any of them? Just let me know your thoughts down below. So that's it for this video. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. And if you like this video, you may like these other videos. Bye guys.